Ever since LBJ, Washington has been treating Social Security tax receipts as if they were this year's income to be spent on this year's expenditures. But they're not. They're an asset that's supposed to be set aside to earn interest and earn value so that when retirement benefits and Medicare benefits come due, that asset is there to pay them. But it isn't there. The fund is empty except for a bunch of IOUs because they spent the money and told us they'd balance the budget. They didn't balance the budget. They cooked the books. Only one president, Ike, has balanced the budget in reality. Even under Ronald Reagan, non-defense, domestic spending, spending just continued to boom. Even under George W. Bush, we added yet another entitlement to pay for medications. No one has really tried to balance the budget. And President Obama has made it absolutely clear he has no intention of trying for as long as he's in the White House. So you can see whither we are tending. For 80 years, we have been tending away from savings and solvency in the direction of spending and bankruptcy, and that is whither we are tending. So Lincoln's second question, where are we now? We know whither we are tending. How far have we gotten? Well, we've gotten back to the foot of that bluff. We've waited so long that now we're on another beach at the foot of another bluff with another choice to either climb the bluff or stay where we are and get mowed down. The evidence of our plight is all around us, starting with this. Three things, just three things, Social Security retirement, Medicare and Medicaid taken together are an unfunded liability of at least $60 trillion, probably more like $80 trillion, that we're going to have to pay ourselves if we want those benefits we've been promised. Well, can't we start setting something aside now to pay for it down the road? We have nothing to set aside, and I mean nothing. In 2009, for the first time in history, all the revenues of the federal government, every dime, went to pay for just four things, Social Security or retirement, Medicare, Medicaid, and interest on the debt. All of it, every penny of it. Entitlement programs and interest on the debt take every dollar of taxes that you and I send to Washington. Everything else the government does, from defending the country to funding education to building roads and bridges, subsidizing agriculture, every bit of it has to be funded by piling on more debt, which means more interest for us to pay. Turn that around and look at it through the other end of the telescope. It looks like this. If we continue to pay for entitlement programs and interest at the present rate, the only way we could balance the budget is to literally shut down the government of the United States. Now, you can laugh and say it's the best idea you've heard all day, but it isn't a good idea. It's impossible. And if it were possible and you shut down the whole government, you'd barely balance the budget. You wouldn't have a penny left to, say, pay off some of the principal on that debt we owe. And what happens, start to say, what happens if? What happens when the interest rate on that debt goes up? And it will go up, and it can go up in a hurry. From October 1st of 1979 to the end of February 1980, in just five months, the yield on a 10-year Treasury note went up four percentage points. If that were to happen today, the United States of America would be Spain, we'd be Italy, we'd be Greece, we'd be bankrupt. In mid-February of this year, the Congress, in response to this situation and to the public outcry about it, passed something called pay-go, meaning pay-as-you-go, meaning the federal government would not spend another dime without first finding a place, source of new revenue to pay for it, or else cutting spending somewhere to pay for it. Well, that sounds good. I suppose the national debt immediately flattened out. No. In the 30 days after pay-go became law, the national debt rose by $245 billion, a quarter of a trillion dollars in a single month. And deficits are piling up at a rate that will add $10 trillion to the debt in the next decade. At the end of 10 years from now, the annual interest on the debt is going to be $1 trillion. As of today, if Berkshire Hathaway up in Omaha wanted to borrow $100 million for 10 years, and the government of the United States wanted to buy, borrow $100 million for 10 years, the market would give Berkshire Hathaway the better deal. The market believes that Berkshire Hathaway is a better risk than the government of the United States of America. And the market is right. 
If Chinese currency and the American dollar exchanged freely, which they don't because the Chinese won't let it happen, but if they did, the value of a dollar would plummet by 20% immediately. And if our government devalues a dollar, and they seem hell-bent on doing exactly that, since your savings and your home and your stocks and your bonds and your 401k are all denominated in dollars, everything you've worked, saved, and earned is going to be gutted of its value. As we look at this bluff of deficits, debt, default, and devaluation, remember this, 80 million baby boomers will leave the workforce in the next 10 years. They leave the army that has to take that hill. And only 40 million younger people are coming on to fill the ranks, making wealth for themselves and for our country. So that is where we are. We are within sight of national bankruptcy and a worthless paper currency, and we are tending closer to disaster every single day. So as Lincoln said, what must we do and how shall we do it? Well, let's start by facing reality and admitting just three things. First, admit. We have to pay the interest on the debt. Otherwise, we wreck our currency and destroy everything we've worked and saved for. Secondly, so default and devaluation, those are not options. Second, let's also admit that that debt has to stop increasing and start diminishing, or the interest just keeps piling up that we have to pay on it. And finally, let's admit we've got to do something about entitlements, or we'll be buried other, under another 60 to $80 trillion of debt with no hope of paying it. So we know, as Lincoln said, what to do. We have to balance the budget, actually run surpluses for many years in order to make that debt turn downward and the interest turn down with it. And we have to do something to stop the onrushing tsunami of entitlements. We're down to Lincoln's last question, the tough question, how to do it. How do we turn back the march of entitlements? How do we balance the budget? Well, first, on the subject of entitlements, the Democrats, I'm afraid, are as silent as midnight in a graveyard. The Republicans have the expert, the go-to guy on entitlements and budget matters, Congressman Paul Ryan of Wisconsin. But Congressman Ryan, while he is not silent about this graveyard we're headed toward, seems to want us to whistle past it. Because what, you know, while the Democrats are proposing nothing, what Congressman Ryan is proposing is that for those over 55, meaning the 80 million baby boomers, Social Security retirement will remain unchanged. Medicare will remain unchanged. Every promise is going to be kept. People under 55, he says, will have to begin going to private retirement accounts and health care vouchers and higher premiums for the well-off. And slowly over a period of time, we'll raise the Social Security retirement age to 70. Let's not be too harsh on Congressman Ryan. He's about the only guy around with the courage and the brains to actually lay a plan out there, but I'm afraid the plan will not do. The boomer generation is the biggest generation in history. We cannot pass through the present without making a difference in the future, and it's going to be a big difference because we're such a big generation. If we demand that our appetite for security in our old age shall be satisfied, as our parents satisfied theirs, then we're going to have voted America into bankruptcy. We're going to have voted free government into oblivion. And China will be the model for the future of mankind. My fellow boomers, you and I have had a pretty good go. We've never had to stand at the foot of that bluff while history whispered in our ear that we must do the heroic deed or live in infamy. And in some ways, it's really unfair that now, as we enter old age, we should have to make sacrifices and try to be heroes. It's unfair that as we get gray and wrinkled and slack-assed, we should have to climb that hill. But we're like the Civil War generation. We've inherited a problem that our parents and grandparents refused to tackle, and we must wrestle it to the ground. If we don't climb that hill now in our generation, it can't be climbed. This is our hill to conquer and our hill to die on. 